where you're going to be ministered today. Would you help me give a warm welcome to our friend, Dr. Maiden? Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, church. How many of you appreciate your world-class pastors, Russell, Maria, amazing leaders? Thank you, Mayor John. Man, what an anointed mayor you have. That's not normal. <laughs> Pretty much everything about this church isn't normal. It is a move of God. I hope that you hold in your heart the appreciation for the uniqueness and the wonderfulness of what God's doing at Pursuit Church. So it's a move of God. God's entrusted your beloved pastor and the leaders of this church with this, this great move. 2022, I believe, for this church will be a movement year. With the miracle property, I heard an announcement in the eighth year, what that means, some kind of anniversary announcement, breakthroughs. So really cool stuff is happening for this church. Um, you take care of winning souls, and God will take care of adding buildings. So he's got it all uh, in store. would like to show you um, a picture of my family. We were in California a couple weeks ago in Laguna Beach where two of my kids live. And there's 17 of us. I have four kids. They're all married and seven grandkids. If I would have known years ago how great grandkids are, I would have skipped kids and gone right to the grandkids. <laughs> they are incredible Oldest grandson in the back there that had on 16, the youngest two girls that are three. Both my sons have little girls. My wife in front of me there with the sunglasses. She's not my daughter, she's my wife. <laughs> 42 years of marriage, I'm so grateful for a, my incredible wife. She is so fun. I, I wonder what Pastor Russell is going to come dressed up as tonight. And uh, I told him, come dressed up as a preacher. Um, that, <laughs> you know, suit and tie. He, he, he's the hippest preacher I know. So I, somehow I feel a little cool just being around him. Um, it, it's rubbing off a little bit. Last night they put me at a really nice hotel, and I'm, I'm by the, the ocean. And when you come, when you live in Arizona, the ocean is, like, amazing. And then we passed over a river. You have a river and the ocean. I'm like, that's not fair. We don't got nothing in Phoenix. And uh, last night I thought, man, this is, I'm going to open the, my, my window, my, my door here, and, and let that ocean breeze come in tonight. And so I, I opened the door. Five minutes later, I shut the door. Uh, that's just, <laughs> the, my plan didn't work out. It was actually a little colder than I thought it'd be. We, I, I want to share a message this morning called, It's Time to Dream Again. It's time to dream again. Would you elbow someone next to you and say, it's time to dream again. Just tell them that. <laughs> Our text will be the 126th chapter of the book of Psalms. If you have your Bible, put it on the screen, and we will read it together. Six verses and talk about what I believe what God has for us. Before we open the scriptures, let me share something humorous. Heard about this family that had identical twin sons. They were so physically similar, hardly anybody but the family could tell them apart, but their personalities were opposite. One twin was a pessimist and one was an optimist. And on their 10th birthday, their father decided to try an experiment. He went out and bought every imaginable toy a 10-year-old boy would want, a new bike and electronic toys, and filled all the 10-year-old pessimist room with all these new toys. And then he went out and bought a truck full of horse manure and dumped it into the Optimus twin son's room. <laughs> Later on that day, he heard someone bitterly crying, and he walked down the hall into the Pessimist twin son's room, who was sitting in the midst of all the open toys, just bitterly crying. And the father said, son, why are you crying? And the boy said, daddy, someday all these toys are going to break, and all my friends will be jealous of me. And look at all the batteries I have to buy. And they went back to bitterly crying. 
The father walked out of the room across the hall to the optimist twin son's room and to his surprise saw him jumping up and down for joy in the middle of the horse manure. <laughs> and the father said, son, why are you so happy? And the boy said, daddy, there's got to be a pony in here someplace. <laughs> and that's what encourage you. If you're in a horse manure season, there's got to be a pony in there. Or as the Apostle Paul said, we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, called by his purpose. If it's not good yet, it only means God's not done yet in your story. Psalm 126, when the Lord turned and brought back the captivity of Zion, the word turned is a great Hebrew word, shab. It means to return to the origin, to restore to repair, to reverse, when God reversed things, when God repaired things, when God restored things. We were like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. God's going to do so many great things in your life. People that don't know Jesus yet are going to see the testimony of your God's faithfulness in your own life. They're watching you, but they're going to see Jesus. The Lord has done great things for us. Every believer should make that your confession. Your worst day as a Christian is better than your best day as an unbeliever. Because you're saved, forgiven, adopted, accepted, justified, the gift of righteousness, the abundance of grace. You have the word, the spirit, the church. You have the kingdom of God. You're accepted in the beloved. You're called, you're chosen, you're anointed. You have so many promises from God. Therefore, we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as streams of the south. Those that sow in tears, liquid prayers, shall reap in joy. He that continually goes forth weeping, bearing precious seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with them. Without a doubt, God's writing a joyful end to your story. Father, we thank you for your word that's living and powerful, that's sharper than a two-edged sword. Anoint your servant, anoint your people, anoint your word. Have your way today, like Pastor said, your kingdom come in this amazing town, in this world-class church. Thank you, God. Show the devil who's boss today in Jesus' name. Amen. I love this psalm because I've kind of lived through the whole cycle of emotional experience represented. Great joy, great sorrow, and a great ending. And so this is a testimony for us. It was written for people coming out of 70, 70 years of Babylonian captivity, and their captivity had been ended by the will of God, by the sovereign providence, by prophetic declaration, by God's intention and power. And now they were celebrating it and also praying now. We, we, we learned from it the cycles, the principles, the dynamics of the kingdom of God. But I love the fact that right away in this chapter, we're introduced to a couple of things. One of them is singing for joy. Our tongue was filled with singing, our mouth filled with laughter. We had gladness of heart. And there was such an anointing. I'm so proud of the people here today that are going through great storms, but yet gave God a great worship. When you can worship God for being good, while you're going through something bad, you create a spiritual earthquake and you give the devil two black eyes. When the devil can't stop your worship, he can't steal your breakthrough. And so I'm so proud of people today that barely made it to church, but yet made themselves worship the Lord. And even in the joy, there is authority. There is miraculous qualities of victories when we enter into joy. Often in the Bible, the Bible doesn't sing, sing because you're happy. Or sing because you have joy. The Bible says shout for joy. Shout your way to joy. Dance for joy. Sometimes we initiate an outcome by an act of faith in our worship. Let me say some things about the dynamics of this church. Worship heals people. 
The faster we worship, the faster we heal. Worship changes the atmosphere. Any place you worship, the atmosphere is changes. Worship changes the outcome. The Syrophoenician woman wasn't allowed by divine covenant yet to participate in a Gentile miracle. But when she fell on her knees and worshiped Jesus, Jesus gave her what she wanted. Worship will take you places you don't deserve to be. Worship will give you things you don't deserve to have. Worship will transform your battleground into holy ground. Worship will shut the mouth of the devil. Worship will transform things. I, I was a young youth pastor in Phoenix, and one night we had an all-night worship session with the young people, and we locked up the church because we were in a dangerous part of downtown Phoenix. We turned all the lights off, and we parked out back so there was no visible sign that we were in the church, and I was at the piano, beating the piano until my fingers bled. And about 3 in the morning, someone began to violently pound in the front door of our church. And all the young people looked at me. They, they were afraid to answer the door. So they said, hey, this is your idea. You answer the door. So I, I answered the door. And there was a man immaculately dressed in a suit. I could see behind him a new Cadillac. And here's what he said to me. I'm a backslidden Pentecostal pastor. I've just come from being with my girlfriend and doing drugs. But as I drove past your church, something compelled me to turn into this unlit parking lot. Something compelled me to get out of my car and knock on this unlit door because I can't go one moment longer without getting right with Jesus. And then he fell on his knees right at the doorstep of our church. When we worship the Lord hidden away in our little chapel in downtown Phoenix, the presence of God began to sweep across the region around us until it found that man and drew him in. Worship transforms cities. Worship transforms culture. When you worship someone out there, four blocks away was about to kill themselves today. But as this church worshiped something, the glory of God fell on them, washed over them, and the enemy was driven away. Your worship will change your family. Your worship today is helping someone in your family who's not here get a victory, get a breakthrough. So what happened in the story is there's a connection us to breakthrough and dreams. The dreams came after the dream of what happened. It seemed like a dream, but I believe it also is a prophetic principle that dreams are important in the life journey of God's people. That we were made and created to be dreamers. That we were made to think about the future and dream about the future God has for us as his children. In fact, you know your heart is healthy when it dreams again. God made your heart to be a dream factory, a dream machine. If you're not dreaming, something's broken in the, the engine, the gear, the gears of your heart. So when Jesus heals you, one of the first things that will show up is you can think again properly and prophetically about the future God has for you. One of the assignments, and the mayor spoke very eloquently about this, about this moment in history, the enemy is trying to steal hope from a whole generation and create perpetual hopelessness or dreamlessness in people's lives that we as the people of God are called to show a different way, a joyful way, a hope-filled way, a dreaming way as we represent God. And so this story says we were like those that dream. We had these dreams and they became realities. And now we're living in the prophetic consequence, the real divine providence of a promise from God. God did it when no one thought it was possible. I'm here to tell you it's your time to dream again. It's your time to see God be God again. It's your time to see the testimony. Your story's not over. Don't you dare give up now. Give God the chance to write a good ending to your story. The Bible talks a lot about a great word called hope. And hope in its kind of simplest definition in the Greek language, it's the Greek word elpis, and elpis means a joyous anticipation of good in the future. So when people have hope, they always have joy. It doesn't matter what's happening now, 
My hope for tomorrow brings joy to my today. The vision you have for tomorrow that determines the decisions you make today. When the enemy steals our vision or our hope, we will make inappropriate decisions because we're not seeing the future God has for us. But God has a future for you. Hope is like oxygen to your soul. Like your lungs need oxygen, your soul needs hope. When, when our soul is deprived of hope, we suffocate with negative emotions. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred, lost or stolen, makes your heart sick. But when desire comes, it's a tree of life. Or when the hope that creates desire comes, it feeds you. It fuels you. My brief story, let me just give it in a three-minute summation. I've married that beautiful woman when we were kids, 21. We were in the ministry the whole time. I've been in the ministry 43 years. And we started our first church. I was a youth pastor and a worship leader, associate pastor, and then started a church when I was 27 in my hometown, moved back to Phoenix area. Scottsdale was my hometown. We started a church called the Eagle's Nest in 1985. By 1995, it was about 5,000 members in that church, and God had breathed upon it. Our worship leader was Israel Houghton. Such a great story there and how God showed me who he'd be before anyone knew anything about him, how he developed in the church. Really cool stuff. We were building a building, a 4,800-seat auditorium, and in August of 1995, our church treasurer, a local businessman that owned seven businesses, owned a jet and lived in a mansion. We had all of our accounts and his savings and loan. He embezzled $20 million from our church. So I encouraged our people. I had my accounts there. 2,000 families in our church did, plus our church accounts. So we had a massive public scandal. That's literally the worst thing that could happen to a church. So our, we were in the front page of the paper 10 times, headlines. Never a good picture of me. So I was like, Pastor Maiden. Look at that monster. And uh, I learned about fake news before you did. <laughs> I, would, I would count the inaccurate or just really untrue things, just unbelievable. But anyways, that happened. We had six lawsuits, two class action lawsuits, 15 concurrent attorneys at the same time covering a wide spectrum of things. Our church grew from 5,000 to 140 the wrong way. We were homeless. We lost our home. We had death threats. We were homeless for nine, ten months. We lost our home, and I became clinically, manically, and suicidally depressed for two and a half years. I knew how serious my depression was because I was finishing my Ph.D. in psychology. <laughs> True story. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. Start this now. You're going to need it someday. <laughs> and it uh, really happened. I was 37 and thought my life was over. And when I did a forensic of my depression, I came to the conclusion that I became depressed the day that I lost hope. When hope walked out, depression walked in. I became so depressed that I wrote a country western album. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm sorry if you're a country western fan. I, I'm sorry you are. Um, no, I'm ju just kidding. I, just kidding. Forgive me. Some, yeah, one of these pastors loves country music. And it really was, you know, th there wasn't a happy song in that little album I wrote. And, but anyways, so that's how, so I, 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 I'm a mess. And the Lord came to me one day in my car and said, Michael, would you like the pain you feel to go away? I said, yes, I would, Lord. In fact, I've made a list of some names. And if you would please kill everybody on this list. <laughs> Old Testament style, New Testament style, doesn't matter. And uh, here's what he said to me that began my, I began my healing journey with this sentence. Michael, if you will forgive the people that have hurt you, I will make you forget the pain they've caused you. Manasseh. I, I knew what he was referring to. Well, fast forward. I did and he did. And God not only took away the pain that was brought to me, God gave me love for the people that had hurt me. Only Jesus could do that. 
Only Jesus can so heal you that you feel an ocean for the love of love for the people that broke you. And so that really happened in, in my city. The people come to, our church was so known for what we'd gone through. People come today. God gave us a comeback, a miracle church. We started a new church 18 years ago in downtown urban Phoenix. God's breathed upon it. God gave us a $40 million building for free. Here's what I found out. You know your heart's healthy when it dreams again. And when I started dreaming about the future, God gave me the future I dreamed for. If you can dream it, God will build it. God will do it. So that's God's promise to us. And so I have so much faith that there's no one here, no one watching, no one listening in the future, that God can't restore your future. Joel 2 says, I will restore the years to you, says God. That everything the locusts devoured, I'm going to give back to you. Yeah. Romans 5.5 5 says this, for we know that hope does not disappoint. Hope never makes us ashamed. Hope doesn't disappoint the person who has hope in God. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. Here's what I found out. The more of God's love I encountered, the easier it was to hope. Hope is easy when you know you're loved. And God reintroduced me to his love, and God awakened my hope. I started dreaming again. God freed me from a serious depression. My grandchildren only know a happy puppy. That's all they know. In fact, my little precocious granddaughter, London, when she was about four, jumped on my lap one day when we were watching the movie Frozen for the 84th time. She grabbed my cheeks and said, Papa, you're the funnest person in the whole world. So only Jesus can do that. Take me out of the dark cave of misery and put me in the mountaintop of joy. This is your turnaround season. God is turning your captivity. Here's what I found out. When I changed on the inside, eventually everything changed on the outside. You can't wait for life to get better before you get better. You can't wait to have a reason to hope, to have a heavenly hope. God gave me a dream, and no one believed in it but Jesus and Mary. Not that Mary, my Mary, the beautiful blonde. That's what God did. God, I thank you for dreams. Acts Acts 2 says, when the Holy Spirit's poured out, Peter said, Young men will have vision. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams. You're never too old for a new dream. It's time to dream again. Come on, someone say, time to dream again. Would you put your hand in your heart, please, this morning? God, I thank you for healing every heart that's wounded, that's hurting, that's disillusioned, discouraged, that's depressed, that's oppressed. I break the power of the devil. I break every lie that's been inserted into the consciousness of your mind. Devil, you're a filthy liar. I command them to leave. I break oppressive spirits. I break the power of nightmares and night terrors. I loosen the grace of God. A prophetic season on this church where everyone dreams and everyone has visions and everyone starts receiving prophetic words about the future God has created them for. And God, I pray for such an outrageous sound of joy to fill this room. My son was a drug addict for seven years after what we'd gone through, his heart broken. But God set him free. He's a pastor in my church, four kids, a man of God, a businessman. There's no one in your family God can't set free. It's time to dream about our children being free, our family being free. It's time to dream about Sohomish, whatever this city is. I apologize. I want to speak in tongues every time I say it. Snohomish. God, do miracles here. Let there be a cloud of glory over this church. Listen, would you stand your feet, prayer team, if you join me down front.